All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for uh, hopping on our webinar this afternoon. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to uh, be a part of this. Our topic today is advice for business owners in a challenging time. And given the unprecedented economic situation, we know that, of course, no one is unaffected by the coronavirus. So we're gonna focus our time today on trying to be tactical, proactive actions, or at least things to think about right now. I'm Chad Hamilton, I'm Director of Practice Management for Brown & Company, we're a wealth management firm in Denver, and I'm joined by Stephen Bell. Stephen is the president of Iron Wheel Solutions, a Denver-based lower middle market business brokerage and consulting group. As a CPA and broker, Stephen understands kind of blind spots that a lot of business owners may have in their business and also what outside buyers are looking for in a merger or acquisition. So we're going to attempt to cover our presentation, our prepared remarks within the next 30 minutes, and then we'll answer questions that you have. Uh, we'll have the slides available afterward as well as a recording of this presentation. And we'll try to get all that to you um, pretty quickly. I would think by tomorrow, we'll get all that out. So don't worry about trying to do screenshots or anything. If there's any visuals that you like, you'll, you'll get those soon. Um, as for Q&A, rather than open the lines for questions, what we're going to do here is we'll receive those along the way. So in your Zoom meeting settings, they're typically at the top of the screen. If you move the cursor up there, you'll see a Q&A box. You can enter questions and you don't have to wait till the end. You can type them in at any point along the way. We'll collect them and then we'll do our best to answer those at the end uh, of the presentation. So before we jump into the agenda for the call, I, I wanted to take a minute just to share this chart. It, it shows visually what we all know intuitively, which is that there's a wide variation of difference in relative exposure to COVID-19 from industry to industry. No one's unaffected by the pandemic, but what's being illustrated here is that the impact varies significantly based on the nature of your business. Those that are highly exposed in red are sorts of the typical discretionary oriented um, expenses for, for consumers and clients like hotels, airlines, apparel, um, are generally feeling this much more than those uh, in green, the telecoms, um, technology, wealth, uh, waste management, food retailers, those types that are weathering it pretty well overall anyway. Uh, the other thing, you may have seen this news today that the NASDAQ index actually turned positive for the year. Now, <laughs> I, I work in the investment industry. I'm watching the markets every day, and that still seems astounding to me in a lot of ways that so much of the economy as we experience it day to day is being decimated or at least in hibernation, as we've called it, at, at the moment. And yet you see actual gains in a big index in the midst of this. So what I'd say to that is, we don't really have one market right now. You know, everyone talks about the market. We, we essentially have uh, two very different markets for equities currently. On the one hand, you have the strength of mega cap technology and life sciences companies that are experiencing a whole different reality than the rest of the market. And I could say a lot more there, but suffice to say that the vast differences in exposure to COVID is a really important piece to understand and keep in mind when we're trying to make smart financial decisions. So let me just show, I wanna show the quickly, this three points on the agenda for our call. So first we wanna talk about best practices and common mistakes during this pandemic. Uh, secondly, how to maximize the value of your business. And then third, how to prepare yourself for exit. But before we jump into the agenda, um, maybe we can just get a lay of the land. So Stephen, welcome. Hopefully uh, you're, uh, you're on there. Can, can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks for being here. And so you work in the transaction space every day, 
whether it's with business owners looking to sell or buyers or capital raises. So in your experience, what are you seeing in terms of M&A activity at the current moment? Uh, much like you just described with, with, with two different markets. Um, overall, for the first quarter, uh, we had about a 25% decline in, in closed deals. With a lot of those deals uh, getting pushed for, further out, but being put on hold, uh, but a good number of, of deals were, were still closing. Um, most of those deals were in process and the groups decided let's let's push forward and, and get this done a lot of the other buyers are saying let's wait 30 days let's wait 90 days and see where this takes us okay i would imagine that's encouraging to hear to the extent that deals are still moving forward uh to some extent so what do you recommend to the owner of a small to mid-sized business who's trying to figure out where best to spend their energy right now? Where should these entrepreneurs be focusing? Can you give just some uh, categories or some, some thoughts around that? Whenever you have a big disruption and we can look back um, historically, right? We have 2008, 2009, uh, we have 9-11 to look back to and previous recessions. Um, whenever we're having struggles in a business, we like to sit down with the business owner and discuss right, core competencies, what, what are you basically really good at? And let's start working with you to make sure we're doing those things. We work with the team and get some flexibility and say, hey, you've just moved all your people off site um, or you've closed your doors depending on what's going on with, with your industry. Moving a large people group of people off site can be a big challenge, but it can be a big opportunity going forward. Maybe you're more comfortable with your management being remote. Well, that leads to an opportunity of another office in another town, possibly, in the future. So we're, we're working with business owners that ideally have some upper management below the owner that can work on those day-to-day -day operations. The owner CEO can meet with them regularly but they are spending a great deal of their time on vision. That's the owner's job, that's the CEO's job, is manage those day-to-day -day operations through their group, and then provide vision and leadership to the rest of the team. So we're working with those CEOs really on pushing forward, being flexible, and looking for places of opportunity that do exist in this current market. Great. And, and what's a, well, maybe I should say, are there any common mistakes or, or pitfalls that you see business owners making? Are there any sort of trends you could look at and say, you know, I've seen this kind of time and time again um, that, that you need to be aware of and try not to repeat the same mistake? Absolutely. One of the large mistakes, a lot of, businesses making, especially small to medium sized businesses, is they want to put their head in the stand. They want to, they want to bury themselves and wait for this to blow over. Many of you have been watching uh, TV since you're stuck at home, have noticed the commercials have frequently changed. Um, the marketing people have advised, right, get the handshakes out of, out of all your car dealership ads because um, that's no longer a, a current part of the, the, the business transaction. So burying your head in the sand and waiting for this to blow over is not gonna help you grow your business. You need to continue pushing forward. You need to continue with, with marketing. You need to work on you know, your brand. Those businesses that continue to do this and increase that brand awareness during these times and historically through all recessions come out much stronger on the other side. So we want to work with them that understand, yes, this is a recession. Yes, these are tough times, but you want to lead that group forward through those tough times. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned commercials and you see these trends, right? Like my kids have pointed out to me that 
uh, they, they said, why do they always say time in these times of uncertainty in every ad? And then I start watching it and sure enough, it's like every single one says times of uncertainty. So I'm going to try not to use that phrase. Um, but uh, anyway, I just think of commercials because you mentioned that. So uh, another question for you, where are we in terms of valuation or, or can you even speak to that at all uh, in, in the midst of, of this? Um, so <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Um, it is a question that is uh, on the top of, of all business owners' minds. And there's two sides to all, all business valuation that the owners need to understand. One, there's a, there's a technical academic uh, valuation used in the courts and the legal system. And they're in a, in a bit of a panic because that's always historical data. Most of the valuations that that group's working on right now are working on valuation dates back uh, end of year, December 31st, or maybe January. They work on a lot of stuff for uh, ESOPs, for valuing the businesses for, for other purposes. The second group of, of valuation question is, you know, what is my business worth to the guy that's going to purchase it? You know, what is the finance side? You know, purchaser going to look and say, hey, what is my business worth? And it's important to remember those are two very different valuation standards and two different, very, very different numbers that each group will come to at the very end. Uh, on the technical side, there's a lot of questions. There is an increased risk that is associated with any valuation right now um, as far as what the business is going to be worth on, on that day or going forward. You're seeing different changes, uh, different models, different types of modeling for, for that um, valuation purposes. For a, a purchaser, a private equity group, a family office, uh, an individual investor, a partner buyout, those kind of decisions, you're not seeing a whole lot of change in the valuation yet, uh, which is good news for, for the seller. And we have... Uh, worked with those people for for months on end and said hey this is where your business is this is what we're doing to make it better this is the value that you're going to that you've created in your business and are taking forward so for those people that kind of valuation we're not seeing a whole lot of changes yet we are changing some deal structures and working on some workouts um, you're going to see a change in owner carries in the next uh, year or two. Um, owner carries are a pretty common part of most transactions. And you're just seeing a shifting of that risk from the buyer to, to the seller um, with, with those kind of workout deals. Um, the buyers themselves have changed a lot of their due diligence process. Um, all asking the same questions, but they're digging deeper into things like supply chain, things that would have been maybe assumed prior uh, that they'd always be able to buy products and bring that into their supply chain. They're spending a lot more time looking at that. They're spending a lot more time looking at receivables. What's the quality of those receivables was always a question, but now it's a much, much more important question. So those are the areas that we're looking at for, for valuations. You know, what have you done to build the business properly? How does your business look going through this forward? How affected are you by this COVID or other issues? Right. And I think the natural segue there then in terms of where we are with valuation is, is what can you do to, to drive valuation? You know, we all know that, uh, how much time, effort, dedication it takes to create a successful business, to take an idea, a concept, and turn it into a reality, make something of it, and make a profitable, sustainable business, and hire people. Uh, I have so much admiration for that. Uh, you know, but, but ultimately, you want to know how to maximize the value and, and the worth of the business, um, and it's never too early to, to think about that, right? kind of the idea of beginning with the end in mind. And so this visual shows how valuation is completely dependent on the perception of a potential buyer. You've got on the left-hand side, higher risk, 
and lower return sorts of attributes. And then on the right side, lower risk or perceived risk and higher perceived appreciation potential. And so moving from those bullet points on the left to those on the right should translate into a business that's more attractive to buyers and consequently provides, creates a higher EBITDA multiple for your business. So anything that helps a business owner move from left to right on this chart is what we call a value driver. And I know I've spoken with you about value drivers, Stephen, and I, I know you, you have interesting insights on this. It's certainly core to, uh, to the clients that you're working with all the time. So specifically, what are the types of things that business owners should be thinking about in order to increase the value of their companies? And maybe uh, this, this could be a really good time to, to start thinking strategically about those things. So, so um, I don't know if you want to just give us a, a few of those ideas. Yeah, the, the uh, great thing about events like this, uh, post 9-11, other recessions, COVID here, gives you the best excuse and one of the best times to look into your business, reinvent it as needed, if anyone looks at this in a year from now or two years from now after you've come out of it, you can always blame COVID. So that's always a nice, easy way to do. But if you can go back and say, all right, core competencies, what are we looking at? All business owners want to sell at the very top. They want to get the most out of it. One thing buyers really like is having some green pasture in front of them. So if we've gone back and cut the non-essential items because of COVID currently. Then we've moved forward and said, these are our growth strategies. We've implemented steps one through five. Six, seven through 10 are in front of us. But now is a really, really good time to test the market and see what's out there. And those drivers that we talk about are making sure you have no concentrations. And we talk about concentrations of suppliers. We talk about concentrations of, of customers. Um, and to a lesser extent, concentrations of, of employees. Um, for the employees, you know, do you have one key in person that they left, the whole system implodes? That person's workload needs to be separated out. Um, or another person hired to help fill in. And not only is that um, a threat to your business. Uh, it's a, if it's a finance position in particular, it's, it's a good point, a uh, position of, of fraud in your business, uh, which we're not here to talk about today, but is always a problem in, in small business. For what to do about it, uh, back in 2015, we were working with a, a client that had about a 30% of their revenue um, over the four year period from one client and that kept the owner up at night and as well it should sure. uh, it's also not going to uh, do anything for the, the buyer they're going to walk in and give an immediate discount as soon as that is identified if that person leaves i lose a third of this business not interested so we spent a lot of time working with them and decided that that client while 30 percent of the revenue was just under, just over, depending on the year, about 10% of their profit. So they had dedicated employees to that person um, and, and they always liked the top line revenue driver. The owner was very proud of the, of, of the top line revenue number. After some time, we agreed to let that client go. They, they, they'd been together for about 15 years and had grown. The one had just clearly grown much faster. And so when they fired that client and broke them up, there was an arrangement. They took uh, two of the employees uh, with, with them. And then in the background, we had spent six, eight months really working on the marketing and getting them new clients. The end valuation was within 5% of pre-firing uh, pre that client and, and after the client. Even with the big revenue drop, with a smaller change in profit, it was not a big threat and they were able to move forward with an exit. 
So that is one of the big problems you have when you have any uh, concentration. The next thing, you have to have well-documented books. Uh, I am a CPA, obviously. Uh, we, we care about accounting. Um, so does your buyer. For a, a first look, any financial buyer, uh, when we put an offer out, and, and a memorandum and say, hey, take a look at this business, they look at the numbers. And then they wanna see, hey, is this well-documented? Is, is it provable and reliable? We wanna present that in a nice, pretty fashion. Um, we want to look at other businesses um, for what they're doing with, with cash conversion, what they're doing to, to build a subscription business. One of the things that they're looking for is reoccurring revenue. Um, the classic example is I, I install swimming pools. But if my neighbor installs swimming pools and also services those pools, they're out there monthly cleaning it, checking on the chemicals. Um, that reoccurring revenue of, of checking on that pool is going to be more valuable to a buyer than the one-time transaction of building the, the, the pool in the first place. And you look at some, some large examples. Um, Harley Davidson, uh, for all the troubles they've gone through over the last few years, have, have something called the Harley Davidson Owners Group. And they get 40 to $50 million a year in revenue just for those people to have their name, Harley Davidson owner group patch on their jacket. So they pay Harley for the right to be able to do that and, and at 40 and $50 a, a pop. Uh, and that's great free cash flow to, to, to Harley Davidson. Uh, Costco does the same thing with their membership. That's most of their profits. So that reoccurring revenue, that, that revenue, with a real emotional tie to it is great if you can establish it in your business. Uh, there's very few businesses you can't do that. Uh, talk about uh, fitness studios, you know, they're coming there and they're paying monthly. Um, all sorts of different examples of creating subscription businesses. Netflix is the, the most obvious one, as we're using that a lot right now. <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least in my house. Oh, yeah. So um, when we're looking at those things, we also want to look at um, different options for, for what you're doing to standardize your procedures, what you're doing with, with the managers and the CEO, how you're working with them and, and those procedures. If the CEO is in charge of uh, deciding, you know, what janitorial service you're, you're doing, uh, going to be using, uh, we have problems in, in the business. We want to be able to pass the business, make a successful exit, and have that, that layer of management in place for that, that private equity buyer, that new buyer can step in. Um, and a great example is if you ask your customers where do they buy your services or goods, um, and they say, Jeff, and the other option, of course, is if, they, if you ask them and they say, Amazon, you want that person to identify with your brand. Everyone knows the, you know, the CEO is just Jeff Bezos, but none of us have uh, Jeff's phone number in, in our cell phone. But we can hit our button and hit Amazon Prime and things show up. You want to start looking at getting your business identified by its brand much more than your sales team person's name or the CEO's name. Those kind of changes are, are really important in the small, medium business world to, to a buyer. Yeah, a lot of good points. And, and I've certainly seen anecdotally a lot of that to be true. And I've also seen this struggle in usual times, let's just say, where the, the old cliche, you're so busy working in the business, you can't work on the business. This may be, and it's certainly not true for everyone, but for, for a certain portion of listeners on this call, this may be a really good time to actually be able to work on the business to some extent. And I think it's exactly the types of things that you were just talking about. Now, since we're talking about driving value in the eyes of a buyer, I think we'd be remiss 
not to at least touch on the different uh, types of buyers that are out there. So I, I just want to give the kind of broad strokes to this. If we think about different exit options for a business, and and by the way, if you if you say, look, I'm 20 years out from transitioning or exiting my business, this is all relevant. It's it's that idea that you know you the the more you think about the end goal the better decisions you're going to make today. So it really doesn't matter as far as time frame. These are good things to, to understand and be aware of. And just on the left side here, you see options one and two, we'll call it, are transferring the company to either family members or key employees. And those both have a lot in common. And that, you know, the benefits of that is you put the company in the hands of a known entity specifically your own flesh and blood or long-term employees uh, who, generally speaking, you believe will run the company a lot like you did. They'll perpetuate the company's mission and culture, hopefully, um, and allow you to stay and remain involved in the business. Um, the, the downside there is without planning, there's little to no cash at closing typically, and that's a problem when you think about funding your own retirement or, or personal financial goals. It also generally requires you to be involved for for a while, uh, potentially ongoing for, you know, post-closing, and then family issues can complicate things. Now, if we look at a sale to a third-party option, that will allow typically maximum purchase price, usually maxes out the sort of cash at closing and total financial package piece of it. It allows you as an owner to control the date of departure and um, facilitates company growth without your own investment or risk at stake typically. Now, the downsides to that are sort of the, the mere, uh, the flip side of, of the first two options we talked about, which um, is the potential loss of your identity, the corporate culture, mission of the, of the business, uh, you just lose control over that, and with that, a potentially detrimental effect uh, and impact on employees because you just don't have control over that typically. Um, so let's think about, you know, Stephen, I, I want to come back to you on this point. You were talking and alluding to this a little bit earlier about owner carry, and, and so maybe we can dig into this a little more. It, it's an understatement to say this is a unique time, of course. We've never had circumstances like this in our, our lifetimes. Um, and, and a lot of business owners might just conclude that there are no deals happening right now, but that's not necessarily true, but it does require some changes in thought process, right? So what do you recommend for those that you know were considering or are considering a sale? How how should how sh it, for someone in that boat, how should they rethink their strategy? So that individual needs to be really honest about, about their, their needs at exit. Uh, as you mentioned with uh, family transfers or even to internal staff transfers, the cash down, down payment is, isn't generally just not there. Um, so being creative with the deal structure um, is, is really where those guys need to be looking. How do I get out and get what I need as well as the business continue? Most business owners care. The number one concern is, is legacy. Um, and that is much more important than total cash number, but being flexible and having the ability to think outside of, I need X dollars is, is really where those guys need to be coming from. Makes sense. Um, so I'm just going to cover this pretty briefly because I, I want to stay close to the time allotment we've got. So in our experience, you know, we think about exiting a business. There's really three questions that entrepreneurs need to answer when they're thinking about that. The first is how much do you need to net from the sale of the business in order to achieve your goals? Second is how do you get paid after you sell the company? How do you create sustainable income that's going to last decades and keep up with inflation? And then third, and this is a big one, what does life look like 
after you're no longer involved in the business. So, you know, with that first question, it's about where uh, personal financial planning intersects with business planning to help determine what is your number? How much do you need to fund your personal retirement and financial goals? And then, of course, those financial calculations are all designed to fund spending goals that allow you and facilitate an ideal vision for life after the sale. The main objective at this stage is to assess what the business is worth today and compare that with what it needs to be worth to meet your goals. So we've just come full circle back to those things that Stephen was talking about um, in terms of how do you close that gap? How do you grow the value of your business um, in order to, to get to that point, uh, that number and where you need to be. So Chad, what is uh, Brown and Company talking about right now? You know, all the, the different changes in the market. What are those conversations looking like? Yeah, I, I think the, the silver lining in any market downturn is often an opportunity to save money on taxes. So first of all, it's just one example, but if, if you think you might have a net operating loss for your business this calendar year, you should seriously consider doing a Roth IRA conversion. And just a um, yeah, brief explanation, you know, if you're converting to a Roth, it means taking tax deferred money and changing the nature of it into tax free money. So say a SEP IRA or traditional IRA is tax deferred, uh, where you will have to pay ordinary income taxes when you pull money out. Well, if you, if you pay the taxes now and convert it to a Roth IRA, you create this tax-free bucket of money. Um, now, if you have a net operating loss, you can actually offset what you would typically owe um, in taxes in order to do that conversion. So if you have a loss from your business, it might actually absorb the otherwise taxable implications. So you essentially create this tax-free bucket at no cost, um, or at least max out the lower brackets if, if there's minimal taxes. So uh, that's definitely something to be aware of. And then another thing, and this is even more universal, is to be aware of the opportunity to do tax loss harvesting. So you find investments you own outside of retirement accounts, and you sell those to lock in losses that you can carry forward to offset future gains, like a liquidity event at whatever point in the future. Now, the key is not to sit, to sell and then sit in cash, but to sell and then simultaneously buy a very similar kind of investment so that you stay in the market, right? You're not out. So for instance, it, if you sold Exxon stock at a big loss, you might buy Chevron at the same time. They're not going to perform identically, but you're still in the same general industry and investment. You're not, you're not out of the market, but you're able to carry forward those losses. That makes a lot of sense, staying in the market and being tactical while still getting those tax benefits. Uh, we, all, we all want to pay lower taxes. <laughs> uh, is there anything that hasn't changed? Uh, any advice that's, that's you've always given? Um, that still rings true today? Yeah, let me, I, I'll kind of answer this generally and then I'll get a, a little bit more specific. So good advice and in, in good smart action, it's always predicated on the types of questions that you're being asked or the types of questions that you are considering. So we really think of three main kinds of questions and they're all equally important. The first are data gathering second or discovery and third or diagnostic. We'll call this planning in 3D because they all start with D of course, but also they're, they're the types of questions when you bring them together, they bring the plan to life. So data gathering questions are quantitative. They're about what you have, assets, liabilities, how much you're spending, saving. It's like determining the GPS coordinates for your financial situation. The second type are discovery questions they help understand where you're going. And these are about what you believe. So whereas a data gathering question might be, when do you want to retire or sell a business? The discovery question would be, what does retirement mean to you? Or what kind of legacy do you want to leave? 
um, financial planning is often represented as a puzzle. And it makes sense because all the pieces need to fit together. It's interdependent. And, and when it's done well, it's, it's uh, comprehensive. The problem with that, though, is that often the single most important piece of the puzzle is missing. Now, if we were live meeting at an event here, I would say, show of hands, anyone know what the, what the most important piece of a puzzle is? And of course, you all probably got it right. I just can't hear you because everyone's muted, but it's a, it's a picture on the top of the box. That's the most important piece. If you don't have the picture, you don't know how to put the pieces together. So understanding and really thinking about what does the next phase of life look like, super important. And that's discovery. That's, that's what that's all about. And then the last question uh, is diagnostic. These are the things that you should know the answer to, but you often don't. So if I'm talking with um, business owners, I, usually it's questions like, who will run the business if you're no longer around? Or how much do you need to net from the sale of the company to be financially independent? In terms of legacy or passing on wealth, it's are your children prepared to inherit money? These questions are designed to uncover potential problems you might not otherwise be addressing. So. I have, a, I just show a screenshot of this up here, but we've developed a tool just in the last uh, month or so, and it's a COVID-19 readiness tool for business owners. It's a free assessment. It's on our website, and you just walk through this 15 questions, takes a few minutes, but it uncovers uh, diagnostic issues like I was talking about, um, and problems you may not be aware of, but also opportunities uh, to think about, like, uh, for, for instance, some of the tax saving strategies I just alluded to. Um, so I'd encourage anyone, you know, if you're, I've never been on so many webinars, conference calls, or watched the news as much as I have in the last couple months. And, and the thing that's tricky is, so what do you do with it? And we just created this because at least, you know, it's something that you can do and you can get a quick assessment in a sense for, okay, this is an area I might want to focus a little more on. Like this first section is the meter, which would be shown to you based on your answers, but uh, how do you drive additional value in your business? Kind of some of the things that, that Stephen was mentioning. Um, the second dial or category is, is about how prepared you are for exit um, and transition from the business and what things do you need to think about there. And then lastly, in terms of minimizing taxes or the extent to which your financial security is contingent on your business, what level of risk do you have there and, and how do you think through that piece of it? Um, so that's, that's the gist of it. I, I would say as far as our prepared remarks, I know we have a couple questions that came in. I do want to put these websites up on the screen so you know where to look as you have um, any questions or want to find out any more information. But I do want to get to a couple questions that were submitted um, ahead of time. And, and I would just encourage you, if you have any and you haven't submitted already, you can go into that Q&A box. It says... Um, it just says q and a it's got the little thought bubbles there, and you can enter those in so one question that came up uh, it says, "What do you think about the markets right now, and where if anywhere do you recommend investing at this point um, so I started to talk about this a little bit this chart will actually this will help with it if um, I talked about the dichotomy between different industries and how we almost have two different markets. So this just shows style boxes, right? Asset allocation. And you can see that small companies have done, um, it's just showing year to date and then one year performance as of yesterday's close. And it's showing that smaller companies are having a lot harder time than large companies right now. And growth is outperforming value significantly. That's what these boxes represent. We've been overweighting large growth for a couple of years. We continue to think that's a good place to be for two reasons. One is if you think about the types of businesses and investments that you feel most confident are going to sustain and actually uh, thrive on the other side of, of this, even if it lasts for a long period of time, it's going to be large blue chip, high quality growth companies. And so that's where we're at. Not because we're saying we think that this is going to be prolonged. 
Uh, we just don't know. Uh, there's not enough visibility. There's enough reasons to think it could take longer than maybe a lot of the market is pricing in. And therefore, we think there's, there's less risk with those kind of companies while still having a lot of good growth potential. And then second reason is, you know, we want to look at it comprehensively. Like I said, for most business owners, their business is their single biggest asset. And if you look at that as an asset, it's really a small or even micro cap uh, equity. So we would want to diversify that and therefore invest um, more liquidity in in larger blue chip companies. So for a couple of reasons, we still like this large growth area, even though it's performed uh, quite well thus far. Um, let's see, let's see if anything else. There's one other question. Uh, if Okay, this is about investing too. If you have some cash to invest right now, how would you recommend investing it um i would just say real briefly so we've we've talked with a couple clients in the last month about this and our strategy is sort of three prongs so we like investing part of it now call it a quarter to a third in a lump sum initial investment in the market a second tranche that's invested over time systematically so you take a certain portion invest the same portion over the next say six to twelve months typically and then a third portion of that that's invested opportunistically, a little more tactical. Um, and, and so what that does, it is allows you to spread it out and hedge a little bit. You're not all in or all out. Um, and if you invest over time, the benefit to that is you're investing more, uh, buying more shares when the prices are low and less when the prices are high, which is, of course, exactly what you want to do. So in a volatile market, a systematic invest, investing approach can can certainly serve uh, a good purpose there. I think those are the only questions I see so far. Stephen, anything else that you want to mention um, in closing here? No, I think it's fabulous. I really appreciate your time tonight. All right, thanks so much for being with us, everyone. And uh, like I said, we'll get you the, the materials afterwards. Uh, thanks so much. Take care. Be safe.